Okay, so we are thinking about collaboration in a hybrid environment. And the first thing is that it is tricky to even know what does hybrid mean? I think every school literally is doing something different. And so what works in one situation and when you would recommend for hybrid doesn't necessarily work in all of them. Um, but the key really to doing collaboration in any environment is to want to collaborate is that you write at the top of your lesson plans really big collaboration and really think through how am i going to collaborate in these lessons if you're not really intentional about it you're not going to do it and I, and I noticed myself falling victim to that this year as i'm trying to like learn geogebra which is not collaborative and i spend all this i mean i spent probably two hours today making a geogebra puzzle and i've been making this huge choice board that I don't have, and there's not literally, now that I think about it, nothing on my choice board of 28 choices, none of them are collaboration. And I'm like kicking myself at this exact moment because if you don't plan for it, it ain't gonna happen. And that's my proof, right? You're just thinking through, like, this is what I gotta do. So I wanna cover, you don't think about collaboration. So my first recommendation, no matter your situation, hybrid or not, is to write the word collaboration at the top of your lesson plans to really focus that in. We do know kids learn more when they collaborate, when they have cooperative discussions. You know, one plus one is not two. So there's a lot of value in putting up with learning how to collaborate. And I think that is really the big main challenge to collaboration in a hybrid or a face-to-face -face situation is that you're not born knowing how to collaborate. You're not born knowing how to stand in a straight line quietly and walk to the library. And when we never say like, well, I tried that and it didn't work. I guarantee you walking quietly to the library did not work. And yet we keep taking them because we know that it's important to go to the library. And it's also important not only to collaborate, but to know how to be collaborative and polite in a digital environment. And so for that, you will realize that kids will act immaturely. It is something to teach and keep teaching in the same ways of any classroom management thing uh, that we have. So um, you just gotta decide you wanna do it and you gotta kind of bear through it. And one of the techniques, don't get upset. You get upset, then it's funny, and they just want to keep doing it just to get your goat. So when some kid draws a penis on the collaborative slides, some kid deletes everybody else's work, whatever it is, the solution is not to lock it down and keep them from doing it. It's to be calm, start a new assignment, let them give them a little time to get it out of their system. So I initially, any collaboration things that I do are more like whiteboards. I have no intention of grading or doing anything with it. It's really just to get them to start. How do you interact with the medium? How do you collaborate digitally? And that's the skill in and it of itself, not necessarily because I'm a math teacher, the math. So there's that. I actually have mostly good luck. I had one very immature class this year. They kept deleting the slides and writing inappropriate things on the spreadsheet. And, you know, and eventually they stopped. You know, and it's it, it. Of course, it requires having discussions and really having those digital citizenship conversations. But it does get old after a while. So endure, and then having those conversations together does improve learning. So you will notice in my slides that I have only two slides, and one of them is my Google Form. So I'm going to go ahead and share this in the chat. Here is my. Google Form, and this is my slides to or form to slides premium. So when you fill out the form, it will add your slide to my slides. And for that reason, I actually build my layouts. But I build all of my slides as layouts. So you'll see when I click on the tiny triangle, I actually have my entire presentation put together. I have. 14 slides to share with you, actually 15, 16. Um, but I'm gonna release them as I'm ready. So this is one of my techniques for collaborating uh, with digital tools, hybrid or not, is that if you expect the students to interact with your slides, which I highly recommend, 
you might want to build your slides in the slide layouts. And that allows you to release them when you're ready. All right. So Very clever. I love it. We are fully virtual for now. So now notice Kimberly had filled out that form and automatically added a slide to my slides. So one of the ways to just kind of dip your toe into collaborating, now yes, the teacher collaborating with the students and not student to student, is, but is to use my form to slides premium add-on. So that is helpful. So Brenda, if you could fill that out, it's gonna come right in there. Almost done. No problem. Like an idiot, I turned on the heat earlier and now it's like swamp in here. Okay, so my husband go back to school. Ooh, okay. Mid January, you're still remote only. Okay. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on the tiny triangle and I have all of my layouts, and you'll notice that I've labeled them from zero 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 one zero two. Apparently I don't have a three. And I have two sevens. Uh, but that's all right. You know, I've numbered them uh, 0102 so that they will alphabetize in the order I think I'm going to present them. But I find that often when I am being more interactive with students, that the order I intended to do something doesn't necessarily be the order. So what's nice about building them in the layout, so what I do is I go to the View menu and I go to Master. And you'll see that I have added all of the layouts here in the View Master. And you go up to the toolbar, there's a plus icon. If I click the plus icon in the upper left on the toolbar, it adds a new layout. And it says rename. So I'm going to rename this 18. I don't remember what I'm on. But that way, and let me put my bitmoji on here so you can see what my bitmoji looks like. No, everyone knows that I put bitmoji on everything. That is a requirement. So I got my Bitmoji. And now when I go to the tiny triangle in my Google Slides and I come down and I see my layouts, you see layout 18 there with my Bitmoji. So I go to view, I go to master, I click the plus icon to create a new layout. I choose rename and I rename it by numbering them. So number them in the order that I want. They will show up alphabetically. So by numbering them, that helps me to know what order I think I'm going to present content to students. The other trick to collaborating is to do file version history and name the current version before you collaborate. Now you'll see that I have messed this up. You two have collaborated with me. So I am going to delete these. I'm going to file. Go to version history and name the current version. And I'm going to call it template. And that to me is really the key. Is before you collaborate on a document, before you release it to students where you have some sort of a template, you go to the file menu and name the current version template. So if something goes wrong during the collaboration process, it is easy to get yourself right back to where it was before the students someone changed the theme or whatever it is. Now I'm actually gonna to go to the file menu, I'm gonna to go to version history, I'm gonna see the version history. And I can see here I have this version of template. Now I'm going to go back to this one, this one. This one is two slides participated. So I am going to restore this version. That's what's really nice about using Google Slides, Google Docs, Google Sheets, is that collaboration really is risk-free. It does capture every two, two to three times per minute. Two to three times per minute when you make an edit, it captures a version. And so if anything happens, you can revert it back to a previous version. If you're not naming the versions, it still saves them. But it's a lot easier to find if you do. So before, you know, frequently, as you're going to ask another question, so I'm going to add this question, what is a collaboration challenge? 
and I am going to go to the file menu, file, version history, name this current version history, current for, ugh. name the current version, collaboration challenge. And so if there is some sort of disaster as you all are contributing, I can roll it right back, create disaster. Here is the form. If you want to fill out my form to slides premium, your responses will become my slides. So thinking about collaboration in your hybrid environment, what is a challenge you are currently having? One thing that's really great about doing something like this is it does help me with wait time. As I can see, I don't have responses yet, so I will wait. Now, if you're in a hybrid environment, and what does hybrid mean? It could be a variety of things. Some are doing an A, B schedule. Some are doing students at the same time um, at school and at home. Um, variety of things. So let's let's think about hybrid in particular being some parts of it are asynchronous. Maybe we could agree on partially that. Some parts of your class are asynchronous and so how do you collaborate asynchronously? Yes, Brenda. Sorry, are we supposed to go back to the other form? It is the same form the whole time. Okay. So you see okay. where so the, says, the uh, just submit different. another response so then each time you can just click submit another response and fill out the same form. Now, I have submitted to Google to have the Form to Slides Premium uh, permanently added to the add-ons menu so that you will have easier access to set this up. But I actually use the exact same Google Form for all of my webinars. So what I'm able to do is in this Google Form, when I'm on the edit screen, and I click on the puzzle piece, it says Form to Slides Premium. And I am able to, when I go to set slides, when I do another webinar, I just click set slides and change, update which slides it pushes to. So that's really all I have to do. That's the only change I need to make is I use the exact same Google form over and over and over again. And I just set the slides different, I just set slides for each session to be whatever it is. When I set the slides, it just asks what's the URL. So whatever slides I'm using, I highlight the URL, I copy the URL, I submit the URL, and now it updates to those slides. It actually opens immediately, it's like, is this the one you wanted? And I'm like, yeah, it was. Yes, most students are not participating on asynchronous days, and that is true. I am actually mostly face-to-face -face, uh, currently, and even face-to-face, -face, my students don't do work. Um, it, it is definitely trickier when you're not there to stand next to them. In fact, what I did today is I had several students who did not turn in the link to their portfolio. And as they're coming into class, I sat next to them like, let's do this together now. And that's something that you lose out on when you're on asynchronous time. Although hopefully you have some ways of messaging them and or their parents and setting up sometimes where you can have some office hours or things to say, let's get these things submitted and worked on. Uh, I don't have any magic bullets for students not doing work other than, I just speaking from experience from my own children, if they think it's dumb, they just won't do it. They just like, I, why am I doing this? And I feel like I'm guilty of this. I, I'm so hard to teach, I, like it's hard. Like I just confess I don't have as much collaboration as I want because I'm not writing collaboration on the top of my lesson plans. I know better. I tell people to do this all the time, and then I'm not doing it. You know, you get lost in the weeds sometimes. And the other thing that I know that is essential is that I think about, is it engaging? Is it, is it contextual for the student? Does the student find meaning in it, or is it just for points? And I know a lot of students, well, first of all, I don't do points, so I can't blackmail them with points. But um, that's not necessarily their motivator. And so 
I am enjoying the challenge, even though I'm like tired and like, okay, they didn't do this, but then I have to look at what I've been assigning. I got this giant geometry book wherever it went. And I will tell you, I don't think there's one darn thing in here that I would classify as engaging. I mean, I'll open up to any page. How could you possibly care about this? Any page. It is uh, contrived, contrived word problems. It's like, well, they don't see these things in their real life or have any connections to it. So I was driving around town today, taking some pictures with my phone to try and get pictures of a place that they know to incorporate into geometry. And uh, then I'm one of my options, I'm doing a choice board this week. One of my options is for them to be able to use any photo in their Instagram. So I'm, I don't have any, there are no magic bullets, none. And I'm gonna do those things and I'll still have students that I will struggle to engage. Okay. Um, students, yes, uh, the glitchy Chromebooks are definitely a problem and I think it's a frustration for all of us. We had an access point that went out and then it was just hit or miss as to whether or not the students were able to get on the internet for a while and that was really a blow to my lesson plan since I basically just assume we're using the Chromebooks and I'm trying, I was trying to just use the Chromebooks and I realized this is dumb. I love paper, I do. Why am I trying not to use paper? I'm in a geometry class. I should have them cut up things and glue stuff. And so now I'm using the maker space and that definitely helps because um, kids should touch something other than a screen sometimes. Um, so what do we do when the Chromebooks are glitchy? Deep breaths. It's, it's beyond our control, right? I mean, that's just flat out. It is, just beyond our control, and it is at a slow pace. So understanding that the Google Slides can be contributed to over time. Now on Google Sheets, you see, I'm gonna go right out of order, and this is why it's so nice to have this uh, in the layouts. So my next slide then is now going to be that Google Sheets allows you to do notification rules. So if you have students collaborate on a Google Sheets spreadsheet, Let's take a look. I'm going to go to sheets.new. Sucker to load a little bit. And I go to tools, notification rules. When you go to notification rules, if there's any changes are made, daily digest email me. So once a day, I would get a notification that students have edited or typed on this spreadsheet. Other things that I do is when students use a spreadsheet, I like to have all students in the same spreadsheet and when they have done work on their tab, I like them to change the color of their tab. So that signals to me, I'm ready for you to look at it. I would like some feedback. So that is definitely one of my tricks. There's no magic bullet, but I will tell you this, the longer the gap between them doing something and them feeling like you're paying attention, the less likely they are to engage. So they have to feel like you're paying attention. So I really think long and hard about my assignments. Do I have time to respond, to pay attention, to notice that they're doing it? I actually get really good engagement when I ask the kids to do a quizzes. They'll do the quizzes. They'll do that. The problem with the quizzes is, of course, is that they're low critical thinking. Uh, I have one girl, and she does it right in front of me. She takes a picture of all the questions, and she goes back and takes it again where she has them in there. Now, of course, the questions are scrambled, and the A, B, C, D is scrambled. So on questions that are like, which of these is an equilateral triangle, she has to at least read it and match it. Um, on the ones that are, what's the answer, X equals 6, then she doesn't. So it really challenges me to rethink the question so that even if they're retaking it a lot of times, it requires that they read it and identify it with a thinking question rather than just what's the answer where they write those down and fill them in. But I know that some students are going to do that, especially where in hybrid is just beyond my control. I cannot control that at all. Uh, I saw my daughter, she was using some website that fill in all of the steps. And that is, I support using that, to be honest with you. Like, 
It's a technology that's not going to go away. So understanding that we can't control what technology kids have access to, we have to really think what kinds of things we ask. So if I can't get into this document quickly, as I, I get the notification rules, and I want to respond in some sort of way that they notice that I'm paying attention, it doesn't necessarily have to be that I'm giving my full feedback, um, then I'm going to assign something else, like having them um, or quizzes, something that's self-graded where they get that immediate feedback on low critical thinking. I like to have them self-evaluate a rubric, self-evaluate, or I like to do peer evaluation. And peer evaluation gets a little tricky face-to-face -face or in a hybrid environment. Um, but for my peer evaluation, what I will do is I will set up a spreadsheet and whatever the student's documents are, I link to them on the spreadsheet so that the peers can open the links from the spreadsheet and actually just put the feedback right on it. That's one of my methods for doing peer evaluation remotely. Questions? Okay. Are you, do you do a webinar where you talk about how you set up that, that kind of spreadsheet with the peer evaluation? I could. You want to submit it? That would be, yeah. That so, would be awesome. On the, I'm, I'm trying work to work on that right now. On the weekly premium page, you'll see it says suggest a webinar or office hours. So I'm just going to get you this link there if you'd like to fill that out. Okay, thanks. I, I, I've decided that I prefer to, if you want something, then it should be at the time that works for you. That That's uh, my rationale. So if you'll submit it, then I'll know what time works for you. And um, if you pick any times that have already gone out, like I already have the schedule out for this week, I'll just bump it to the next week. Can, can the um, can you set the notifications in a spreadsheet on the spreadsheet that are your responses from a form? Yeah. So when you go to the tools and you go to notification rules, you'll see it says a user submits a form. You can also have the form notify you. So you'll notice when you're in a Google form and you go to responses and you go to the three dots on the responses tab, you can get email notifications for new responses. You notice I get less options when I do it that way. When I do it from the spreadsheet, I get this daily digest option. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So if a student submits a form, you want a daily digest to know that they have submitted that form so you can come back to it. Yeah. And I highly recommend that you do that. And whatever document that you're using that the students are currently collaborating on, star it to the bookmark bar. So you see here my bookmark bar. I have a, well, I have all my like Google Classrooms and stuff up here. And if I want to order food. So if anyone would like a referral link to my every plate, I think we both get 20 bucks. But <laughs> Um, but I have my quick links up here as things that I need to get back to quickly, including any documents. Like if I have a lesson plan I'm working on and I haven't finished, um, one of my things when I bookmark, you'll notice this E for the every plate. It doesn't say every plate. And so when I'm in a Google Doc, new one, I've been looking at it. Oh, this is my lesson plans. And you know, I want to remind you that at the top of my lesson plans, I want to write, collaborate, really big, big, uh, very large. Because if you don't, it won't happen. We always think we will, but it's, it's tough to plan for collaboration. I mean, if you think about all the things, not only if you think about all of the things that you need to think about. I was teaching pre-service teachers, and I made the world's longest lesson plan document. I think it was 17 pages long, and I had all these boxes for them to fill out, and they fill out the same one lesson plan all semester long. As they learned something, they modified their lesson plan to include, well, how are you going to think about ELL students, and how are you going to increase the DOK? And if you, I mean, and I, even at 17 pages for my lesson plan, that still does not incorporate all the things you think about when you are doing a lesson plan, right? So what is it that you want to focus on of all the things that you could think about? 
uh, be it collaborate, be it increasing critical thinking, be it giving students choice, having some sort of meaningful context, whatever it is you want to focus on, just write it real big at the top of your lesson plans. And I promised you a bitmoji, so let's get that sucker back in there. Okay, so then what I'm going to do is I'm not done with this lesson plans, or I'm going to come back to it. I actually am going to click the star up in the URL, and I'm going to delete. You see where it said lesson plans? Control Z. It gives me a suggestion, which oftentimes is really long. I'm going to delete that, and you will see that it is, I have a lot of things that are, what happened to it? I fit, oh, you know why? Because it's in this folder. You see it says folder, old GC, and I actually want it to be on the bookmarks bar. So it's real important you're paying attention to where it is bookmarking to. I want it on the bookmarks bar. Let's try this again. I have a lot of bookmarks. And so you see I just have this Google Docs icon, and I'm dragging it over here. So any documents that I'm not done with, that I'm asking students to collaborate on, where there's asynchronous action happening on it, I'm going to bookmark it to the bookmark bar. Because it is really important if students wrote on the slides, if they wrote on the spreadsheet asynchronously, that I'm checking relatively frequently. And again, one of my tricks for doing it on a spreadsheet is to have the students uh, change the color of the tab when they're ready for some feedback. All right. So notification rules are very helpful. Uh, do you have any tips for collaborating when you're in a hybrid situation? Let me get you the link to this form again. You might not have any, that's fine. What are some of the unique challenges to being hybrid versus in person is it's, it is the asynchronous element. You have, no matter what, not all students are participating for whatever reason. They're absent because they didn't log in. Um, we'll just go with that one. And we're gonna get them to participate later. Uh, one of the things that I require that they do is when they do participate later, they link to their portion of the collaboration and paste the link to that in the private comments in Google Classroom or maybe into a Google form so I know to check it because I'm not going to hunt this stuff down when after I've already checked it. It's just not even possible. Oh, that's a good one, starting in pairs. Instead of putting everybody together all in the same one, we ask them to practice how to do it in pairs. So in that case, this is a great life skill, is knowing how to share a Google Doc. The problem with Google Classroom is it does the sharing for me, and I never have the students create a document and share it. But outside of school, that's what you have to know how to do. So I love this idea of having students do it in pairs and share it explicitly in the pair so that they get that practice. So excellent. Something I got to warn you, if you do do these through Google Classroom, if it gets turned in, uh, the students lose editing access. Both students or all the students who are collaborating do lose editing access. Um, so one of the ways to get around that is to not make them through Google Classroom or I have them put the shared link in the private comments instead of turning it in as a link or instead of putting it in from Google Drive because that stops it from ownership switching. Okay. Yes, that's an excellent tip. So why do I love Google Apps? Uh, you know, it's cloud-based, so I get all the problems with it being in the cloud. I traveled a lot. I was constantly on a plane. I'm constantly someplace that has 
no or low Wi-Fi, and yet I persevere with using Google Apps. Anyway, it does have offline mode, but I certainly have been in many situations where I just couldn't do work because I didn't have access to the internet. So why, why do I put up with this is because I always collaborate, even if I'm collaborating with myself. I collaborate with myself by using my phone and my computer at the same time. I collaborate with myself by sharing it with my other account. So I'm on my school account and I share it with my personal account. I collaborate with myself by duplicating the tab. So on the tab, I right click and I choose duplicate. So I'm in the same document in two tabs, but in different places, like where I'm writing my paper and where I'm doing the bibliography. Like when I'm on the stream and when I'm grading student work in Google Classroom, I will almost always have Google Classroom, the same Google Classroom open up twice in two different tabs and just makes me a lot more efficient. When all the versions are in the cloud, there's advantages, and when everything's in the cloud, there's some disadvantages. It goes both ways. But remembering that Google Apps are designed for collaboration should help you to remember that you wanna be collaborating with your students in a hybrid environment. So it's that share button, and I gotta think about how am I gonna utilize that share button? Google Classroom automatically manages the share button, but as I try to get students collaborating and working together, sometimes I have to think more explicitly and have them share and collaborate in groups. Uh, Google Sites is collaborative. I don't have that as part of my uh, presentation slides. I'm just now realizing this, and I'm not really, because I in my workshop on collaboration, I have you collaborate on a Google Sites. So Google Sites websites are collaborative, and it has basically the same kind of sharing. It's slightly different, because there's two ways to share. You can share the view access, and you can share the edit access. So it has two share options. Other than that, it's pretty similar. So you can actually put students together that they generate information and collect and share resources all together in one Google site, and then they can be on their own pages which is really uh, more co uh, cooperation than collaboration. True collaboration has task switching, task switching. So me saying you do slide one, you do slide two, you do slide three is like two-year-olds playing. They play near each other, they don't play with each other. And I think a lot of times our collaboration ends up just being more cooperation, but that's still, good too, but I do want to make that distinction. So really thinking, of how am I going to take advantage of this share button because doc sheets and slides and Jamboard and Google Sites and Google Maps, My Maps, Google My Maps, all are collaborative. And I don't have a slide for My Maps, but allow me to show you how that works. So if I go to mymaps.google.com, now my husband is an English teacher. He'd have the kids read, is it Into the Wild then? Yes. Yeah. He would read Into the Wild, and he would have them take context clues from the story and go into a map and figure out, like, where did they think this guy was traveling from wherever the heck to Alaska, uh, where he was along the way, and they would drop this in. And you can do that collaboratively to gather those context clues. So I create a new map. I'm going to name this, and then you'll notice that it has this share option over here on the left-hand side. You've got this gray stripe to add layers, you've got a preview button, and I'm going to choose share, and it's going to be the same exact sharing dialog box that I would get with a doc sheets or slides. And so having students collaborate together around a map is a great way to get them some context for whatever activities they are doing. And so then you have them drop a pin, they're gonna add a marker somewhere, and then they can add photos, they can write in the description, they can link to documents. So it's a way to share resources and things through a map experience. And Google My Maps saves to Google Drive, which means they can turn into Google Classroom if they're the owner. In Google Classroom, only the owner can submit. So the way around that, when I go to the share option, you'll notice I still have the copy link. So I want to change that 
to anyone with the link can view and copy that link. And instead of submitting that as a link to Google Classroom, I just have them paste in the private comments. So if they're, if they're not the owner, they can paste in the private comments and then they can submit it when they're a collaborator. So Google, it's mymaps.google.com. Let me go ahead and add that just as a regular slide. Okay, down here. And I'll add my picture here of one of the things that I particularly like is anyone with the link can edit. Now remember my first trick is I use file version history and we name the current version before I give them access to it so that collaboration is risk free. It's like we all know the kids who really are very concerned about their grades and collaboration that makes them nervous because who knows what the other people are going to do. Uh, so I, I in particular show those kids how to name the version so if anyone does some shenanigans in the group document, they aren't going to lose their work. I mean, it captures it anyway, but the more people you have in a document, the less often it saves edits. So just so you know, a little fun fact. Okay, adding my next layout. My favoriteest thing is just collaborative Google Slides. I create one Google Slides, and I ask students, whatever the activity is, to submit it to the same Google Slides instead of, you know, if I have 30 students, that's 30 documents turned in, and I got to open up all 30 of them, and if I give feedback to one person, one person sees it. And it's just really not sustainable, especially in a hybrid environment, for you to look at everything. I think the number one complaint or frustration that I see teachers sharing with me is the amount of paperwork that they have now that we're remote. I hear you. I mean, paperwork is, so I, I like to make a joke, is that when I'm in Google Classroom, let me see if I can pull up a Google Classroom here, uh, and you add a document, and by default, that document is anyone can view. And then if you change it, create assignment, and just create a document on here. So the default is can view. So I like to reword these, can view. The middle option is students can collaborate. I much prefer students can collaborate over make a giant pile of paperwork for myself. Wait, what? Yeah, you're assigning yourself paperwork. Now, sometimes I have to. I just try to use this bottom option 20% or less because no matter what way you cut it, I don't scale. There's only one of me. So if I can do a quizzes, a formative, a quizlet, a that quiz, a gim kit, a kahoot, any of these things uh, where I don't have to grade it, that cuts down on my amount of paperwork. If I can choose this middle option, collaborate, that also cuts it down. Because one of the things I want to do is I want to have students contribute to this Google Slides. If it's asynchronous, I have them copy the link to their slide. I have a slide for this, I'm pretty sure. They are going to put a link to their slide in the private comments. So if they're on slide 12, they control L, highlight the URL at the top of slide 12, and copy and paste it into the private comments so I can see their individual contributions. But instead of me going through and giving feedback, when I have an opportunity, like when we do either face-to-face -face or a Google Meet, I put up these collaborative slides and we do feedback together. You know, if you do feedback by yourself, you run the risk of wasting your time. If they don't read your feedback, you wasted your time. And I hate that. So one of my tricks is when I give feedback, I require that they respond to the feedback before I release their score. That definitely helps. But even better is I just don't give feedback by myself if I can avoid it, is I prefer we do feedback together because class discussion, the person doing the talking, the person doing the thinking, is the person doing the learning. So I put the slides in there and we talk through some of the student samples together 
feedback is given. I know they all got the feedback. And again, one plus one is not two. And classroom discussion, if you look at John Hattie's list, is one of the most highly rated for effectiveness for learning. So getting the kids more to talk about their work than to do their work is not only going to result in more learning, but it's going to be less paperwork for you. So coming back here, when I'm in Google Classroom, I try to lean more towards the middle option. Students can collaborate rather than make a giant pile of paperwork for yourself. I like to say it's like a hamburger. The good stuff's in the middle. And this bottom one is like poison. You can drink some of it, but too much will kill you. Too much paperwork will kill you. So I just, of course I, of course I give each student a copy sometimes. I just try to do it less and try to think more about collaborate. All right, and then my next slide. Now this is what I've been working on this week. I'm hoping to put this out as a blog post tomorrow, is that I now have breakout rooms in first slide. So if you'll let me show you how that works. I'm gonna go to alicekeeler.com slash first slide. And when I say breakout rooms, I just mean collaboration. They, it's not breakout rooms, it's four breakout rooms that you already have. So whether you're doing it in Google Meet or Zoom, just let that load for a little bit. As you know, with anything that I've coded, you gotta wait a good solid minute for the code to load. It's like it's stapled on there. Go to the add-ons menu, it's not there yet. Add-ons, here we go. See, first slide is now there. I'm gonna show the sidebar. Need to authorize it. And I code it myself, so it is safe. And you'll see I have the first slide options here. And what first slide allows you to do is if you have assigned every student their own copy, make a giant pile of paperwork for yourself, uh, then first slide helps you cut down on that paperwork by ingesting all of their slides and grabbing the text off of the first slide, and I also have the option to pull it off of all of the slides. And if you are a premium member, you are able to pick and choose which slides you want to pull it off of. But you'll notice this is brand new, is I have added pile of slides into first slide. So you can go to alicekeeler.com slash pile of slides, and it's its own product standalone all by itself. Uh, or you can use the pile of slides, which as of yesterday, is now incorporated into first slide. So I go to pile of slides, and what this lets me do, I say show list, and I'm gonna put my group names on here. So I'm gonna say group one, group two, group three, group four. Now the email addresses are optional. If you do put an email address on there, it will share it with whoever's there. I believe you could do it with a comma. So like you could do one student, and then the next student in the group, you should be able to separate email addresses with a comma uh, to share it with more than one at a time. I believe that'll work. But if you just click Make Slides, what this is going to allow you to do is to make one slides per group. It's going to put these slides into the spreadsheet. I'm really hoping this works because I literally was working on this code this morning. It is brand spanking new. All right, so you'll see that I now have linked is a slides for each group. I can set slides, and so I'm gonna take this slides presentation, and in my first slide, which is pile of slides, I'm gonna set the slides because I can actually push new slides to the breakout room groups. So my idea here is that each group would have a Google Slides to participate on while they're in the breakouts. This is something that I've heard a lot, is when the students go to breakout rooms, how do you get them to talk? How do you get them to work? Well, each if each group has a Google Slides that uh, flows them through what they're talking about, that they contribute on it, they have things to answer within it, you're gonna be able to have a higher probability that they will participate and talk. I've, again, no magic bullets. I have none of those. I'm gonna to go to breakouts. 
and you'll see that I have these options for these breakout slides. So if I click share spreadsheet, the problem is, is that my first slide spreadsheet is private to me. And it's got stuff on there that I don't necessarily want the students to see. So when I choose to do the breakouts, why did it only do three of them and not four? Okay. Oh, there it is, okay. Uh, it apparently goes in reverse order. But um, I've got the groups slides and I have the link to their slide and notice the share button in the upper right hand corner. It's automatically anyone can view. So what I would do is before we get into a, a Zoom or a Google Meet, I would do alicekeel.com slash first slides. I would go to pile of slides. Instead of names, I would designate groups. And then I would create a spreadsheet, or excuse me, a Google Slides per group. I share the spreadsheet. And because this spreadsheet is automatically anyone can view, Okay, so Brenda, you are group four, um, and Tina, you can be group three, and Kimberly, you can be group two. So you would be able to find your group slides depending on which group you are assigned to. I can't mess it up. That's the key here, right? Is how many times do you share a document with students and you forget to change the sharing permissions? this automatically changes the sharing permissions. And what you'll notice is when you open those slides, you do not have edit access. That's because Pile of Slides is not designed for group work necessarily. If I put their email address in there, it shares it with the person that I'm trying to create the slides for. So I've been creating it for a group. So don't worry, I have fixed that. I have a button that says Enable Editing. And when I click on this, it's gonna make all my group slides, anyone can edit. So if you'll just wait a sec, and then refresh, you'll be able to edit the slides. Now, each group has slides that they can be working on. I would um, be able to push my slides. I create this group once, and then I could push slides to structure the conversation. I'm able to do that, and I can click here, let's see if this works, so that I can open the slides, that I could see them all at once. So that I'm able to, okay, so there's group two. Open the next one. Come on, baby. Do it. I was afraid of that. So I have set a utility sleep in between opening each of them. So if your internet is really fast, uh, it gets ahead of the internet, the utility sleep, and then what won't open the next one because it's still already opening one. So it kind of chokes but it does work sometimes if your internet is slow it'll work i know that's so comforting and since you're all at a school it should work at your school yeah finally slow internet is to your advantage uh but it doesn't really matter i mean i really just have to just click on the links in the spreadsheet it really doesn't take me that long to open all of them but in theory in obviously in theory clicking open slides will do them all i have gotten it to work i have i have I might set the delay to be a little longer now that I've seen how this works. So I'm able to get in those slides and go to each of the tabs and I can see the students working in the breakout rooms and how they're collaborating. And then from the first slide on the breakout room options, I can send a times up. It's updating, letting the students know that time is up. And it actually puts this stop sign on all the slides. At first, I was trying to do it on the active slide, and then I realized that doesn't work because it only works on my active slide, not their active slide, because it's my code that's running. So that was a fail. So and I just put it on all of them because I figure you can just easily just delete it, like whatever it does. Um, if you want, you can do slide stamp. So instead of saying time up, I'm like, talk about the war of 1812 now. And again, it'll put it on all of the slides. Just wait for it. It's coming. It's going to be amazing. It's updating it. It's thinking about it. I have to say okay. And then there we go. It just throws on there, and it does it to all the groups all at once. Um, I can send a slide to the slides. So I'm going to send a slide. I'm going to push slide 
three. You remember I set my slides to be this presentation slides. So what should happen, and it's kind of slow. Oh, please work. It's not really that slow, um, but it does take a few seconds. It is sending slide three to all the groups. So like I send them a slide, they work on that in their breakout room, and then a little bit later, I send them the next slide to work on, and it just shows up in their slides as I want to push it out. Mm. Come on, show up. Just do it. It wants to. Okay, slide updated. Yeah! <laughs> hey, look, Kimberly, it was your slide. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to um, send the slides, and I'm going to send the first slide so that you can see slide one. It does work. It didn't take that long. It does. It does take a few seconds, though. So that you still need permission on the slides. You have to refresh, Kimberly. Pretty sure. No. Let me enable editing. I pushed it. If it doesn't work, I'll go fix the code right now. So what happens when I copy and pasted the pile of slides into first slide? Uh, not all of my variables matched. So I've been going through trying to like swap out some of the variables so that the two codes talk to each other. So I bet that's what I did. Dang it! it if you do alicekill.com slash pile of slides, it's literally the exact same menu. And it does work in there. Um, but I will fix this. It will work the next time you try it. Uh, this will be a quick fix. So enable editing. In, it that, Wait, let me refresh. I haven't refreshed these either. Nope, still, still. Why? I'll figure it out. I'm not going to do it for you since it's at 8 o'clock. Um, and then I can revoke editing access by clicking no edit. So I have them working in the breakout rooms. They have edit access because when I click enable editing, uh, it will work. I will fix it. And then you'll do no edit, and then it restricts their editing so they know that they need to come back to the main group. I hope that you liked that. <laughs> um, I could think of a lot of reasons I'd want to use it, uh, hybrid or not. As getting, it's just basically making a way for students to collaborate on Google Slides pretty quickly. quickly. That's alicekill.com slash first slide. I have a ton of other ways that I would suggest for you to collaborate in a hybrid environment. Um, but you know, an hour goes by quickly. So I'll just real quick include my template tab. So when you're in any spreadsheet, if you go to the add-ons menu, you can get add-ons and you can install template tab. I kid you not, I talked to the principal today and he created a spreadsheet with the parent teacher conferences um, who signed up. He had like a template and he had a tab per teacher, bless him, because that's what I want too. I love that. But he did it by hand. And I'm like, oh, my friend, let me, he already had my template tab installed. I'm like, next time, just use this. It goes so much faster. So let me just demonstrate that really quickly. If I have a roster, like here's all the teachers' names. Healer, Castro, Smith, Ask, or whatever their, those are math teachers. And, um, then on the next tab, I've got, you know, parents who came to the conference. One, two, three. That's basically, it's a little more complicated, but something like this. Just for fun, I'm going to use the paint can because it makes it stick out a little bit. Uh, so then I just go to the add-ons menu and you go to template tab. And when you run template tab, it's going to copy this template uh, for each person on the roster. So you can see how right now mm -hmm. I've got one for Mr. Ask, one for Mr. Smith, one for Mr. Castro, where they can all collaborate on this spreadsheet and list which parents came to the conference. Now, that's really awesome, except I like to do this with students. If you've taken any of my workshops, you've seen me do this a million times, that you open up an assignment, there's a spreadsheet, and you find your tab, because I don't want to copy per student. I like everybody in the same one. And then that way we can look at each other's, we can do feedback together. And even if you copy off each other, hey, guess what? They copy off of each other anyway. But at least this way, I have less documents to open, and my life is just better. I have... I was going to show a sample of where I did Jamboard. So, but Jamboard is collaborative. It's a whiteboard that they can all write on. You can only have 20 slides. So what I asked them to do is to add a post-it sticky note to their frame. Probably keep calling it slides anyway. 
And then I have a couple of things that I've coded, alicekeeler.com slash group docs and alicekeeler.com slash copy docs classes that allows you to more easily create collaborative documents amongst your students. Uh, copy docs classes will create a copy per class or per group of whatever document you pick out of your drive. So it's not um, the first slide, pile of slides only does slides. Um, copy docs classes will copy anything you got in your drive. So that's pretty nice. And that's it, that's all I have. So I will add on here um, final questions and I'll give you the link to the Google form again. Okay, so questions, concerns, compliments. All right. So if you felt the form, it will add it to the slides, but otherwise, um, you're obviously welcome to turn on your mics or have a really great evening. Thanks, Alice. You're very welcome. To Glad you're home. Uh, me too. <laughs> that was nice. Thanks, Kimberly. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.